Welcome back to the Accessible Art History YouTube channel. This week's episode is a continuation of my five must-see masterpieces series. Finally, I'm going to be talking about my hometown museum, the Seattle Art Museum. Although this institution is fairly new, especially when compared to some of the other museums I've covered, it has a fantastic collection that covers a variety of cultures. It was hard to pick just five, so make sure to check out the Instagram at accessible.art.history for a bonus sixth masterpiece. To learn more about the Seattle Art Museum, then keep on watching. First, however, I think it's important to cover the history of the museum itself. Things started off in 1906, relatively late by museum standard. This was when the Seattle Fine Arts Institution was founded, the precursor to the SAM. A couple of decades later, it was renamed the Art Institute of Seattle by Carl F. Gould. He was an architecture professor and architect at the University of Washington. The group did not have a permanent space, but they did hold exhibits at several venues around the city. In 1931, the president of the Art Institute, Richard Fuller, and his mother Margaret funded the construction of a beautiful Art Deco space in Capitol Hill's Volunteer Park. It took two years and then the space was finally opened in 1933. An astonishing 33,000 people visited the space on opening day. Over the next several decades, the SAM received donations that built up its collection across all periods and cultures, but that also meant it outgrew its space. On December 5, 1991, the downtown building was opened. This is where the SAM is located to this day. The collection the collection was eventually split with the majority of the Asian art being moved into the former museum's building in Capitol Hill. In 2007, the Seattle Art Museum opened up another extension, the Olympic Sculpture Park. This outdoor space is free to the public and is a popular hangout on the beautiful Pacific Northwest summer days. Today, the Seattle Art and Asian Art Museums, as well as the Sculpture Park, are vibrant and important parts of this city's art scene. It is important to note that the buildings occupy the land that was once occupied by the Coastal Salish people. This is a fact that the SAM acknowledges on their website. All right, now that we've got the history down, let's dive into the masterpieces. The first one is this Cycladic female figure. It dates from around 2500 BCE and is from the Cyclades island chain in Greece. It's made up of about 30 small islands and was first settled around the 6th millennium BCE. They were rich in ore and minerals, including marble which is what this figure is carved of. The Cycladic female figure is rather simply constructed and appears almost modern to our eyes. It's made of simple geometric shapes with only the basic representations of humanity. For example, there are no facial features besides a sharp triangular nose. The only reason the viewer can determine that this figure is female is due to a slight pubic triangle and small rounded breasts. Her arms are folded across her chest, but the reason for this gesture is unknown. Archaeologists have found it so many times in digs on the Cyclades that it has garnered its own acronym, FAF, for Folded Armed Female. The next masterpiece is from 14th century China. It's made of wood that was once lightly painted with brilliant colors. The sculpture is of a Luhan, or the original disciple of the Buddha. They were enlightened figures who received supernatural powers because of it. This particular Luhan was able to summon a dragon. These were powerful beings that could bring life-giving rains. In a time when agriculture was absolutely vital, this was quite the power indeed. Dragons could also prevent floods, making sure that people were safe. They represented prosperity, rain, and enlightenment. We can see how hard the Suhan is working to summon the dragon. His teeth grit in concentration and his muscles strain with effort. There's a tremendous amount of motion making this a true masterpiece. In my opinion, Georges de la Tour is one of the most underrated artists in history. Although it's unknown if he met Caravaggio or not, it is clear that de la Tour was inspired by him. He took tenebrism, or the contrast between light and dark, to another level. The edges of this painting are almost completely black. The scene is slowly lit as the viewer's eyes move inwards until they finally see St. Irene tending to the wounds of St. Sebastian. This work was painted in around 1638 or 1639, right at the height of the Baroque era. These two saints were some of the most important in early Christianity. They were both leaders in the early church and were martyred for their beliefs. In this scene, we see one of the better known moments of their story. St. Sebastian was tied to a tree and shot at with arrows. After the soldiers left, he was taken down and St. Irene helped attend to his wounds. Notice how De La Tour used the light to highlight the most important part, the arrows and the healing process. This next piece is important to the museum's collection because it speaks to Seattle's indigenous heritage. It is called the Mask of the Moon and dates from around 1880. The Nuxlock people made this mask to honor the moon, or as they called it, Tilyak. They used it during their winter dances as a way to honor it. 
On this mask, there are several figures. The first is a carved face, representing the moon slash Tilyak. On the top, there's a whale, and on either side, a bird. Below is another face, but more stylized. Each of these surrounding figures is created in a style found across First Nation art of the Pacific Northwest. They are made up of specific shapes and color blocked with primary colors in black. Each of the animals is also in profile. One striking element of this piece is the use of blue. Our historians theorize that this pigment was acquired via trade with the British to symbolize the sky, Tilyuk's domain. The final piece of this video is Jacob Lawrence's The Studio. Not only was Lawrence a beloved Seattle artist and professor at my alma mater, the University of Washington, but he is one of the most important black artists of 20th century America. He was a big part of my video celebrating black artists. I recommend you check it out. It's linked up in the eye and down in the description box. This work, painted in 1977, shows Lawrence's first studio in Seattle, which was on the top floor of his home. It has a sense of both chaos from the scattered painting and a casual ease from the homey space. If you look closely, you'll see a scene of Harlem outside the window. Lawrence included it to show his other hometown. This work shows the artist style well, especially for those not familiar with it. He gravitated towards primary and neutral colors and a flat, almost geometric composition. It's an important piece of the museum's collection because it represents a local hero and a master of paint. The Seattle Art Museum is a landmark of the city's art scene. It brings together a variety of cultures and time periods for everyone to enjoy. These are only five pieces from its expansive collection, but I did my best to pick out ones that represented a bit of everything. I hope that everyone gets a chance to visit it someday and see it for themselves.